Okay, hi guys. Welcome to another um, Monday night study. Today what I wanted to talk to you about, just a short study on some definitions. In the New Testament, or actually in the Old Testament, in the Minor Prophets, we have uh, several points or phrases for the Messiah. And reading through the Old Testament, especially for Christians that uh, follow the New Testament, uh, it's obvious that it's for the Messiah. So we have this term uh, or phrase, the teacher of righteousness. And then we also have the rod of Jesse, for instance, and the son of righteousness that arises with healing in his wings. And these are things that I've, I've known about in the Old Testament for a while, pointing to Messiah. But there's actual several points or times in the Damascus document and a few other places that talk about the teacher of righteousness. And it's an interesting thing because today we'll still have, and I understand there's a lot of Jewish uh, people that don't want it to mean Messiah because it's too Christian. And so they'll try to come up with ideas like, well, maybe it was the founder of the Essenes, or maybe it was another guy or this person or that person. The, uh, the manuscripts make it very clear. The teacher of righteousness is the person that the lying priest put to death about 40 years before the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. So that in no way could be the founder of the Essenes or anything like that. He'd have to be two to 300 years old uh, for something like that to happen. So it's obvious we're talking about someone they considered the Messiah that died around 32 AD. Um, you know, and they connect him with a lot of the other prophecies too, like the Melchizedekian priest, who is God incarnate, who comes to die for our sins in 32 AD, according to their calendar. So it's really interesting to look at that. So I wanted to kind of do that tonight because I want us to have a really firm grip on that kind of thing. So this is me still working on the Damascus document, and uh, I'm coming along pretty good. I've got the Covenant of Damascus pretty much done uh, as a rough draft, and now I'm working on the community rule. And then in connection with that, there's 4Q instruction. It's all basically the same kind of stuff. And I think when we pull it all together, it'll make a lot of sense. Um, so, um, and then we'll have, there's, there's books that are mentioned in the Damascus Covenant and in the community role, like the Book of Time Divisions, which is a prophecy book. Book of uh, Hagi, which is a herbal medicine book. And then the way of light versus the sons of darkness and a few other things like that. So we'll have a chap chapter in here on the teacher of righteousness. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Um, and so basically, there's the teacher of righteousness and the son of righteousness that arise with healing in his wings. And we've seen that in many places. But let's start first by understanding as a Christian, there's a first coming and a second coming. And as we see in the Testaments of the Patriarchs, they had always been taught one Messiah with two comings. And that's fairly clear. And so we have this, this concept of the festivals or the Moedim teaching prophecy. And we're probably very familiar with that. For instance, the um, um, Passover Seder very clearly teaches on the first coming of the Messiah, his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, very clear in the symbolism. And then there's Pentecost and then the fall festivals teaching on the second coming, that kind of thing. So with that in mind, let's take a look at this. In James 5, 7, and this is a quote from the King James, and I'll be explaining the, the quotes to you here, but James is talking about the second coming and the fact that everything's planned out, so we need to be patient and wait for the Lord to do what he does in his own timetable. And in the midst of that, just be righteous. And he says in uh, James 5, 7, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of our Lord. So we're supposed to patiently wait for the second coming. Behold, the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. Now, this is a, a term for crops. And basically, you have two rainy seasons. And as far as planting, um, the time periods around there, depending on how much water your crops need, you plant them at the proper time. But 
you can't have multiple seasons in one year unless you have multiple rainy seasons or can do that kind of thing. Um, some crops can. Uh, barley harvest, I think, is quick enough that I think there's two uh, barley harvests. There's one wheat harvest. And then uh, olives and grapes take years to bring in a harvest. So uh, that kind of a thing. But in this case, James is actually quoting a prophecy from Joel. I knew it was in Joel, but I didn't realize it was in Joel and uh, uh, Hosea and a, a few other places till I started looking at the Damascus covenant. So the whole concept here is that the Messiah comes in the early and the latter rain, or in other words, in the spring and in the fall. And the festivals around the spring and the fall teach on the first and the second comings. So this is an old idiom, uh, the Messiah coming or salvation coming, Yeshua coming, uh, in the early and the latter rain. And that's the way that that works. So he's actually quoting this concept from uh, Joel, which we'll see in a minute. So again, remember the concept is be patient to the coming of the Lord. So we're the focus James is having is on the second coming. We've been here. We've seen the first coming. We were his disciples, James, Peter, Paul, John, and they're saying he'll, he'll come back. There's a second coming. So just be patient. And he comes like the early rain and the latter rain in a year's time. So, and it goes prophetically with the calendar. So here is the quote that he's doing, and this is from Joel 2.23. And um, actually, before we do that, let me just pull up that in the King James, just so you can kind of see that I'm not tweaking anything. So in Joel 2.23, I'll show you what it says in the King James, and it looks a little different. King James is my favorite, uh, but at the same time, we have um, others here. Let's see. Okay, so 223, and it says here, let me just make this bigger. Might be easier to do. 223, there we go. So be glad, children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, because he's given you Oh, this is a bad translation. Let me run back, run back to King James. Here we go. Be glad, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately. And this is really interesting because it can be translated like this. And he will come, cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain, in the first month. And again, we're talking about the concept of the calendars. There's a fall calendar and a spring calendar the first months of that would be nisan where you've got passover and the first month of the other calendar is tishrei where you've got the high holy days so in other words we could be talking about the messiah coming in two separate places or two separate times fall feast spring feast but this is kind of coded it says the former rain moderately and it comes, the former rain moderately comes down like the former rain and the latter rain. That's kind of an odd thing if you're going to translate it that way. The spring rain comes down like the spring rain and the fall rain. That doesn't make sense. So when we do this, if we go ahead and flip this over to the King James Plus, and we're just going to see this here. The, uh, he has given you the former rain, and we can look on that, and it's the word mora. Now, mora actually means uh, teacher. And as you can see that, it says there is the concept of an archer or a teacher or rain. It's the idea of something shooting forth. So it's by, um, if you're talking about a teacher, it's someone that says, you're going to memorize this. There's going to be a test. We're going to make sure that you memorize it, that you learn this, as opposed to just allowing people to learn as they go in their own way. So there's two different teaching styles. In this case, Mora means teacher. Uh, it could also be archer, and it could also be the early rain, because the early rains come very heavily, I guess is the idea. And moderately, so the former rain, the heavy, moderate rain. Again, it's kind of odd, right? The heavy, moderate rain. Anyway, so the word translated moderately, moderately is uh, zadaka. 
Zedak is righteousness. Zedaka is a righteous act. And as you can see here, that it's normally translated righteousness, okay, or rightness, uh, justice, moral virtue. Uh, figuratively, it can be justice, moderately, act of righteousness. There's nothing in here about, uh, well, moderately. And that moderate righteousness injustice is kind of an odd, odd way of doing it. So with this in mind, you can see how we get this. For some reason, they're translating this, the former reign moderately. The former, and again, this is mora, meaning uh, early reign, archer teaching. So the heavy former reign moderately will come down like the heavy for, first reign moderately in the first and the second month. So this is kind of an odd translation. So here is the way the Dead Sea Scrolls translate it. Be glad then, children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you Mora Zedek, the teacher of righteousness. Okay, and that is our Messiah. We, we should know this. He's given you the teacher of righteousness. That's why we're rejoicing. And he will, who's the he? It's either God, which is the Father, in this case is not going to descend, or the teacher of righteousness. So the teacher of righteousness, he will descend for you as the rain, as the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. That makes a whole lot more sense. So the Messiah is what we rejoice in, and he's going to have two separate visitations, a first coming and a second coming, a former rain and a latter rain. Just like you've got two seasons of rain per year, in the spring and the fall, there will be spring and fall festivals that teach on the comings of the Messiah or the teacher of righteousness. So you can see how he's doing here, going back to James. Be patient about the coming of our Lord, the second coming, because he will come, you know, be patient until he receives the early and the latter rain. This one says God will send us the teacher of righteousness he will descend like the rain, the former and the latter rain in the first month. So especially this, this phrase, in the first month, that's definitely talking about spring and fall seasons, spring and fall Moedim, rituals that point to the comings of Messiah. So very, very interesting. But it doesn't stop there. Uh, that in itself would be enough. And I knew about Joel and I knew about James. I did not know about Hosea. So this is going to be the same kind of thing. Hosea 10, 12. Let me, let me first, uh, well, let's just go on with this one. We'll look to the next one here in a second. Um, so here's the teacher of righteousness again. Uh, Hosea 10, 12. Hosea says, show yourselves in, so rather, just like the crop thing again. You're planting, you're sowing, hopefully you get the rains and you get crops. So sow yourselves you and I are supposed to sow ourselves in righteousness. We can think about the parable Jesus did about the wheat and the tares. So sow ourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until the teacher of righteousness comes to you. Again, that's uh, Yorah Zedek. Yorah is the other word that can be translated rain also. Uh, but it's also teacher, and it's the idea, the mora is the teacher, like the arrows, the sharp to the point, take the test. A yora is teaching in general, but it can be an easy way of teaching. Um, a child, for instance, can be sent off to a school to learn to cook, and there will be tests and, you know, all this stuff. Or you can simply watch mom and dad cook pick up things as you go along, and by the time you're 18, you're a fairly good cook. But there were no tests, no pressure. It's a different teaching style. So that's really interesting to me. So the Lord, the teacher of righteousness, is both formal, specific, things are important, and then the lifestyle that we have, he'll guide us as we go. The things you're supposed to do are not the things that I'm supposed to do, and vice versa, on some things with specifics that God wants you to do with your life, specifics that he wants me to do with my life. 
but there are then there are specifics we all adhere to. We all have to accept uh, Yeshua the Messiah as our Lord and Savior. We have to try to do righteousness. Uh, none of us are allowed to go out and murder and steal and things like that. So there's specifics and generals. But notice that then. So he's saying here in Hosea that you should sow yourself in righteousness, reap in mercy, and break up the fallow ground. So the fallow ground is another symbol like the uncircumcised heart, the idea of pride. So be humble, understand, just believe what you're told. You and I are sinners. We do some things right and some things wrong. Some of the things we do wrong, we know it's wrong. Other things we actually might think they're right, but they're wrong. Why do we get confused? Because we have a sin nature and it messes us up. If you just accept that and go forward, then you can have a relationship with God. So you can't have an uncircumcised hard heart. You can't be hard hearted. Sow in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up that fallow, fallow ground of your heart. It's time to seek the Lord and you need to continue doing this until the teacher of righteousness comes and then a new dispensation of, or age of grace will occur and some things are different. And this is what the prophet Hosea is teaching. That's really fantastic. Now, when we back up, uh, that's 10, 12, but if you back up to chapter 6, uh, he talks about this. And in 6, 3, Hosea says, Then we will know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, just like the day dawning. Peter uses that about the day star arising in our hearts. So the symbolism is the same. And of course, the sun of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. So he says here, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he will come to us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain unto the earth. And that makes it pretty clear. The Lord is coming, and his going forth or his appearing is just like the morning when the day dawns. It's night, it's darkness, you can't do anything, it's horrible. As far as you know, we're all going to die. It's just horrible. And then all of a sudden, the sun arises, and you can see everything. And then the night, the disease, the attacks, the animals, or whatever is going on, you can see them. And now everything's fine. So the morning comes, and every, the darkness flees. And of course, if his morning comes, and there is no sunset, no night ever again, then there is no problem. Everything's fixed. But he comes like the morning, like the latter rain and the former rain to the earth. So same thing again in the first month, spring and fall festivals. Um, so we go on here. Now, here's the prophet Malachi. Malachi 4, uh, 2 says, uh, But unto you that fear my name shall the, shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And you will go forth and grow up as calves in a stall. See, a calf out in the wilderness may or may not get food, may or may not be eaten by a predator. A calf in a stall gets plenty of hay and food. He's fed. He's taken good care of. He's in a stall that protects him from predators. So this whole concept is that when the son of righteousness arises with healing in his wings, that's salvation of our and healing also physically, but the concept of us being uh, made right with the Lord. So we can see here then the son of righteousness and the teacher of righteousness is the Messiah. There's two comings, first and, and second, uh, spring festivals, fall festivals. Very, very clear um, at, if you believe in the New Testament. So, so now we go through, and the concept here is that many scholars keep repeating this idea that the teacher of righteousness in the scrolls is the founder of the group. Okay, now they say in the Damascus document, we saw this a week or two ago, in the very beginning of it, it says that the Lord appeared to them because they were trying to figure out what was going on, part of a prophecy of the 390 years. When that was over, it was 197 BC. And when that was over, they said, basically they had a Christophany, the, the word of the Lord appeared to them and help them to understand the prophets were back. And so no matter how you look at that, if the Essene movement officially 
started at 200 BC, 197, and the teacher of righteousness dies in 32 AD, he's, what, 230 some years old. It's not possible. So it's very, very clear that we're talking about the teacher of righteousness being Messiah. So let's look at a few of those things. Um, in the Habakkuk commentary, uh, it reads, um, during the time of the Roman occupation of Israel, which is between 64 BC and 135 BC is when they actually come back. But during that time period, the teacher of righteousness was persecuted by the liar, and you can go back, I think we have at least one or two uh, YouTube videos, and should be on the other, uh, the, uh, the website also, on the Pesher Habakkuk, Habakkuk commentary, where we go through all this, so you'll see all this in there. But the teacher of righteousness was persecuted by the liar. He's the official priest, so we know him to be Caiaphas. But this lying priest persecuted and put to death the teacher of righteousness. The people of this apostate prince, or pre priest rather, followed the liar. And it goes on to say they refused to listen to the teacher of righteousness. And they were uh, unfaithful to the new covenant who have not believed in the covenant of God. That's an actual quote from the Habakkuk commentary. So the people that rejected the teacher of righteousness when he tried to bring the new covenant of grace, the new covenant of Damascus, they followed the false priest. And this is what's going on. And the first priest, the false priest persecuted the teacher of righteousness. It goes on to say that these people that followed the false priest would be destroyed by the Roman army at the end of the age. So the end of the age is 75. So sometime before 75 AD, everything would be destroyed. The warriors that fought for him, of course, they're headquartered in the Temple of Jerusalem. So that means the Temple of Jerusalem will be completely destroyed by the Romans before 75 AD. And it was about five years before. This wicked priest called the liar, it says, committed crimes against the teacher of righteousness and the men of his council. We remember what the Sanhedrin, probably led by Caiaphas or Annas or, some, or both of them, or their proxies. The Sanhedrin took, I think it was Peter and John, told them that they couldn't preach in the name of the Lord and, and had them whipped, remember, in Acts. So they persecuted the Essenes and the Christians, all those that believed in Messiah, that wouldn't follow their command. So again, we're getting back to the same idea that the apostasy, it doesn't matter so much what we're talking about, but the actions behind it. Uh, whether it's a pre-trib, post-trib rapture, whether it's salvation by faith or works, whether it's whatever, the authority of the Pharisees, the authority of the Sadducees, whatever it is we're talking about at some point of doctrine, and somebody gets angry with you enough deciding that they have the authority of the government to push. And they're going to arrest you, kill you, whatever the case may be, because they are God's instrument. At least that's what they think. And this is the point of the apostasy. If you were to say, I worship Lucifer, I worship Jesus, I worship Buddha, I worship him, you know, Krishna, whatever. And we all disagree, but nobody's going to try to kill anybody. We're going to try to talk to each other and hopefully convert each other. That's what we're going to be trying to do. That is not the epitome of, of the apostasy. It's when things get violent. And we see, we see this even in Protestantism and the fight between the Protestants and the Catholics a couple of hundred years ago, a few hundred years ago, and all the other stuff between the Muslims and the Jews and the, the Muslims and the uh, um, Hindus, you know, and the Pakistanis and all that stuff. And all these different things that happen. So this wicked priest, the, the liar, commits crimes against the teacher of righteousness and the men of his council. So if the teacher of righteousness is the Messiah, who was Jesus Christ, then the men of his council are the apostles and the first century Christians. Up until 75 anyway, because by that time everything is destroyed. No more authority, 
as far as a governmental to actually officially put someone in jail or kill them. So the authority of the Sadducees and Pharisees were wiped out. Uh, so they could, uh, so how could this guy have been, you know, the founder of the group, an adult at 200 BC, die at 32 AD and be the same guy, 230 some years apart. So here's a few other points about this same story. This is from 4Q171, uh, which is a commentary on Psalm 37. And it says that the wicked priest who watched the teacher of righteousness to kill him because of the ordinance of the law which he had sent to them, or sent to him. Uh, so I think what this is saying basically is that there's a wicked priest, which would be the liar, which would be Caiaphas, uh, carefully watch the teacher of righteousness, that would be the Messiah, for a way to put him to death because his teaching was different than theirs and he, he threatened their authority. Um, and later on, that same paragraph says, at the end of 40 years, they shall be blotted out and the wicked shall no longer be found in the land of Israel. Kind of, let me see if I can get that a little bit better here. There we go. That looks better. Um, so, um, and we see it down here a little bit further, but the wicked priest has the uh, teacher of righteousness put to death. And in this particular paragraph, he's trying to kill him. And then at the end of this, this time period, the people that follow the liar, the wicked priest, um, will be blotted out. And no longer found in Israel. And that's about 40 years after the confrontation between the teacher of righteousness and the lying wicked priest. So again, if Jesus died in 32, give or take a year, whatever, but around 32, 40 years later, or about 40 years later, is the destruction of the temple. So somewhere around 32 AD is the prophesied teacher of righteousness that comes down as the latter rain, the former rain and the latter rain upon the earth uh, to give us healing in his wings. Uh, the one that is the Melchizedekian priest. So this is what this is saying. Now, if we go to the other commentary, 4Q173, it's a commentary on Psalms 127, 129, and 118. Why in that order? I don't know, but that's what they have. <clears throat> Supplications from the teacher of righteousness and the true priest at, I should add more to that. Yeah, this is a work in progress as always. So there are supplications or, or things that the teacher of righteousness do and continue to do for us until the end of the age. I thought that was interesting because it talks about the end of the ages. So in their time period, all of this stuff, about the first coming prophecies should be done and over before 75 AD, the end of their age. And the commentary on Micah, which is 1Q14 and then 4Q168, says uh, that they quote a passage in Micah, and then it says, this concerns the teacher of righteousness who expounded the law to his council, Jesus who taught the apostles, and to all who freely pledge themselves to join the elect of God and to keep the law of the council of the community, who shall be saved on the day of judgment. So you're saved because you are following the teacher of righteousness. Apparently he has authority to save. So he is a the savior. So and here's uh, some of the stuff from the Damascus Covenant. I've just got this in red because I'm not sure the the order that we'll have it in. But anyway, it says, From the day wherein was gathered the unique teacher, so when he was gathered in, I don't know if that means he started his ministry or he died or what, but if we're talking about Jesus, it's three and a half year ministry anyway. So the beginning or end of his ministry or the ministry in general or his death, 32 A.D., from the day that one was gathered in the unique teacher. And it's a different word for this, but it's pretty obvious we're talking about the teacher of righteousness, uh, the rod of Jesse, um, the unique teacher, 
all terms for the same person. So from the day this unique teacher was here to the destruction of all the warriors who followed the man of the lie or the liar, the lying priest, the wicked priest, will be about 40 years. So think about this. Um, people reject Messiah. They put him to death. They continue to follow the Sadducees and Pharisees. They continue to battle it out because they're apostate. They continue to battle against Rome. From the time the Messiah came, had his ministry, and died, about 40 years later, the Romans will come in, besiege the temple, and people who understand the prophecies understand the age of sacrifice is now over. There's no reason to be in the temple. The Romans want it shut down, shut it down. It's not a big deal. And they just walk off, and the Romans allow them to walk off because they're peaceful. They're not, you know, vigilantes or that kind of thing. The people that say, no, we're going to do it our way because the Sadducees and the Pharisees command it, they barricade themselves in the temple and fight against the Romans. Well, what happened? The vast majority were, were killed, executed, not executed, but it was killed in battle. And I think it was like some 100,000 of them that barricaded in the temple were taken prisoners and sold into slavery by the Romans just to get them dispersed. And then the temple was destroyed, which is what Jesus prophesied would happen in Matthew 24. So, but about 40 years. So 40 years exactly from 32 AD to 72 AD, that'd be 40 years, it was actually 38 years that the Jerusalem temple was destroyed. Now, 41 years later, the Alexandrian Jewish temple that the Essenes ran, uh, Titus came to destroy it, besiege it, whatever. They understood the prophecies. They were just doing their, their stuff. But now it's the end of the age. Within three years, the Romans are here saying, shut down or we'll destroy you. They don't fight. They say, fine, here's the keys. We're, we're gone. We're believers, and they're allowed to walk away because they're not a problem. And the temple was shut down. It was never destroyed. It was just shut down. So that's pretty interesting. Now, from the Testaments, the Testaments are the writings of the, the patriarchs from Adam to Aaron. Some of them actually talk about the things the Messiah or the teacher of righteousness will do. So let's look at a few of these. In the Testament of Simeon, chapter 7, He's talking to his kids, and it's a prophecy about the Messiah. My children, obey Levi and Judah, or obey Levi. In Judah, you will be redeemed. The Redeemer comes from the tribe of Judah. Do not rebel against these two tribes, for from them will arise the salvation of God. For the Lord will raise up from Levi, as it were, a priest, and also from Judah, as it were, a king, who is both God and and man so he will save all the gentiles and israel so did you notice that god and man consistent theme emmanuel god with us very straightforward very easy to understand um and i've always wondered about why levi and judah he's a direct descendant of judah therefore king but i think somewhere in the midst of the the marriages, he's also descended from Levi. And you can kind of see this because Elizabeth was a cousin of Mary, and she was married to Zacharias, who was a priest, to be of the tribe of Levi. So John the Baptist was a direct descendant of Levi through Aaron, Zadok priest, of course. Um, so that, but they were cousins. So somewhere along the line, the, it kind of merged. So really interesting. We don't have a direct record of who married who, and I'd like to get that, though. It's probably in here somewhere. Testament of Levi 18. So here's what Levi says about the situation. His star will arise from heaven as a king shedding forth light of knowledge in the sunshine of the day, and he will be magnified in the world until his ascension. The concept of death, burial, and ascension was already uh, well talked about. But notice, you know, Peter says, uh, we have a more sure word of prophecy of which you would do well to take heed until the day star arises in your hearts. So the sun of righteousness, the day star, 
sunshine of the day. It's all metaphors of the Messiah, light and darkness. He will shine forth as the sun in the earth, will drive away all darkness from the world under heaven. There will be peace in all the earth. Definitely will be at the millennial reign. The heavens will rejoice in his days. The earth will be glad and the clouds will be joyful. And then Testament of Judah chapter 22 says this about the Messiah. He is the salvation of Israel. And the word salvation is Yeshua. Probably means the salvation of Israel, but it's also the Yeshua of Israel. Can, can always be a play on words. So he's the salvation of Israel that will come at the appearing of, this is interesting, the God of righteousness. The God of righteousness, the teacher of righteousness, who is God incarnate with healing in his wings. Consistent stuff back and forth. Testament of Judah chapter 24 says, After these things a star will arise to you from Jacob in peace. A man will arise from my seed, so a descendant of Judah, descendant of David, like the son of righteousness. Now, here we have a, a whole concept, son of righteousness, just like we read up before, the son of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. So we're actually talking about, again, the son of righteousness. Walking with the sons of men in meekness. He appears as a man. He's, he's the God of righteousness, the teacher of righteousness, walking in meekness with men and in righteousness. There's no sin found in him, which is cool. Same thing that John says. The heavens will be opened above to him to shed forth the blessing of the Spirit from the Holy Father. So the Spirit is given in some form different than the way it was back then. He will shed forth a spirit of grace upon you. Spirit of grace. It's kind of an interesting choice of words. You will be to him sons in truth, or sons of truth. You will also walk in his commandments, the first and the last. We don't walk necessarily in the Mosaic commandments, but in the Messiah's commandments. For all practical purposes, they're the same thing. It's the moral parts. If you understand the law of Moses correctly, you would understand they're the same. This is the branch of God Most High, the, the Nazarene, the branch. This is the wellspring unto life for all flesh. Remember what Jesus said about if you believe in him, out of your bellies will flow living water. I think it's connected with all these, the wellspring. The scepter of my kingdom will shine forth from your root, a stem will arise, you know, the rod of Jesse from the root of the, the tree. It will arise as a rod of righteousness to the Gentiles to judge and save all that call upon the Lord. Paul said the same thing. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So here's the Testament of Asher. We're not going to go through a whole lot more, but I just wanted to be thorough in that teacher of righteousness part. Asher says this. You will be disregarded in a dispersion like useless water. There is going to be this dispersion by the Romans um, or Babylon uh, until the Most High will visit earth. That's one of the times of visitation it keeps talking about. So the Most High, that would be God, says he will come as a man eating and drinking with men and in peace he will break the head of the dragon through the water. He will save Israel and all the nations, God speaking in the person of a man. Therefore, teach these things to your children so you will not disobey him. If they kept in mind the whole concept of the Messiah, who he is, what he does, they wouldn't miss him. But the lie was so deceptive that half of Israel or a good part of Israel missed him. Much like the apostasy in our church. If you're a person that says, I don't want to take anybody's word for it, I'm going to listen to a few people, I'm going to go to church, but I'm going to take some time on my own and I'm going to read the Bible. Maybe some commentaries too. So everything could be a little off. I'll read it through and then I'll study the prophecies and the, and the morality and things several times. And after I've 
studied it three, four, five times, I should have a really good grasp of understanding of what it means, and then I'll decide for myself. If you do that, you will not fall into any kind of weird theology. You might for a short time, but if you keep reading the scriptures, it will dawn on you what the idioms mean, and it'll become very clear. <clears throat> Testament of Benjamin. The Most High will send forth his salvation in the visitation of his only begotten one. So there's only one Messiah, uh, two, com two comings, but he's the only begotten of the Father. Testament of Aaron. Remember, this is Moses' brother. This is pretty cool. Uh, his word will be like the word of heaven. His teaching will be in accordance with the will of God. His eternal sun will burn bright. The fire will be kindled, kindled on all the corners of the earth, and it will shine into the darkness. So that's just really cool. Remember Aaron, in the Testament of Aaron, he's the one that talks about if you want to be in God's grace when the Messiah comes, have nothing to do with the nails. So, and if this was written by Aaron, that would have been about 1400 BC. Messiah comes in 32 AD, is crucified. Ob obviously have nothing to do with the government structure that crucifies the Messiah, if you want to be in God's grace. Again, it wouldn't be hard, though. All the prophecies, if you took them literal, there's going to be a guy named Yeshua. He's going to be raising the dead, healing the blind. He comes in 32 AD. He's put to death because of our for to pay the penalty for our sin nature. Uh, some of the signs that happen when this happens, the veil of the temple will be ripped in half. And then there's several other things. So if you had believed that and been taught that as not symbolic but literal, and you're actually literally looking for it, and then one day you see that happen, you know it's not hard. So here's that verse I was talking about, 1 Peter 1.19. You've also a more sure word of prophecy. Prophecy sometimes can be vague, but parts of it can be very, very sure. We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you would do well to take heed, as to a light that shines in the dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So this is all that symbolism about the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. So here is, and we've talked about this before too, we should have a video specifically on 11Q13, but that scroll refers to the Messiah as the final Melchizedekian priest, okay? And it actually says in the scroll that the Messiah, or not the Messiah, but this Melchizedek is God. So God incarnates apparently. When he comes, he will pay the penalty of our sin nature, which reconciles us to God. It doesn't actually say in that one that he dies, but he does something that reconciles us to God. You have to kind of put them all together. Uh, but he's put to death by the wicked priest. And obviously that's the event that does it. This event occurs exactly, and this is what it says in the text, one Shemitah, which is a seven-year period, after the end of the ninth Jubilee, Jubilees are 50-year periods, of their age. So the end of their age was the end of the eighth honor, which is a 500 year period. Okay. And so one thing you can say easily for sure that the thirties AD or even the first and second century BC and AD put together, however you want to do it is inside of a 500 year period. So it's really easy to find out the honor or the 500 year period. So at the end of that, which would be 75 AD on their calendar, if you back up 50 years, that brings us to 25 AD, 75 minus 50 is 25. Uh, and then from there, that's the end of the ninth Jubilee. And then one Shemitah later, which is exactly seven years, no extra years, 25 plus seven is 32. So according to their calendar, the Messiah was supposed to die and pay penalty to God, which reconciles us because of our problem with our sin nature. That event, whatever that event is, occurs in 32 AD. And again, the teacher of righteousness, you know. So this has just been a small study in this, but I wanted to kind of pull this together. So if the teacher of righteousness, and I go back up here to the top, if the teacher of righteousness is the Melchizedekian priest who is God incarnate, who comes to die for our sins in 32 AD, 
He's consistently talked about as God in man, brings salvation. He, if he's alive in 32 AD, he couldn't, if he's a normal guy, he couldn't be alive in 200 BC. So we're not talking about the founder of the Essenes or anything else. It's really, really specific. The unique teacher, the teacher of righteousness, the rod of Jesse, the son of righteousness with healing in his wings are all referring to the same person. So really straightforward. So we'll go ahead and stop there for tonight, and then I'll come to the um, chat room and we'll look at some questions. But hopefully you guys like that. It, these things are really interesting to me. And again, you didn't learn a single thing, really, that you don't already know. If you believe the New Testament, you know Jesus is Messiah. He's God incarnate. He paid for your sins. You believe on him, you're saved. You don't, you're not. Straightforward. But to see these guys teaching the same thing uh, all through the different manuscripts is pretty amazing.